In this video, we're going to talk about the causes, symptoms, and treatment of hyponatremia. Hey, what's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is going to be all about the pathophysiology behind hyponatremia. We're going to break down this imbalance really simply. That way you can understand it for your tests, the NCLEX, and most importantly, clinical practice. So don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another physiology or medicine video and let's get started. So body fluids are distributed between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. The intracellular fluid compartment is within each cell and the extracellular fluid compartment is all the fluid that is outside of the cells. This includes fluid in the blood vessels, and the fluid that is between the cells or in the tissue spaces. And by the way, the fluid in the tissue spaces we call interstitial. The composition of the intracellular fluid compartment is different than that of the extracellular fluid compartment. In the extracellular space, there's lots of sodium and chloride, but small amounts of other electrolytes. In the intracellular space, there's lots of potassium and moderate amounts of magnesium, but small amounts of sodium and chloride. So when we take the word hyponatremia, we break it down and hypo means low, nat is the prefix for sodium, and emia means blood. So hyponatremia is a low blood sodium level. Normal serum sodium is between 135 to 145 which means that hyponatremia is a serum sodium level of less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. So sodium is responsible for osmolarity or how concentrated a solution is. The more sodium that's in a solution, the more concentrated a solution is, and the less sodium that's in a solution, the less concentrated that solution is. Additionally, sodium plays a big role in nerve and muscle function. Remember that the flow of sodium across a cell membrane is what is responsible for action potentials. So hyponatremia causes swelling of cells. Remember that where salt goes, water follows. In a normal cell, water flows into and out of the cell in equal amounts. But in hyponatremia, there is not enough sodium in the extracellular space, which means there is nothing keeping water in that extracellular space. So water will flow by way of osmosis into the cell, and this will cause the cell to swell. So hyponatremia is either caused by water gain or salt loss or a combination of both. So water gain can be caused by the following situations. The first situation would be an excess antidiuretic hormone production. We call this abnormality SIADH, which is actually an endocrine disease where too much antidiuretic hormone is secreted. This antidiuretic hormone causes water to be reabsorbed into the blood. This water dilutes the sodium and causes hyponatremia. The second cause of water gain is renal failure. So in kidney failure, glomerular filtration rate falls, which means we are filtering less fluid. And if we are filtering less fluid, we ultimately excrete less fluid. The retained fluid will dilute the sodium that's currently in our bloodstream and make us hyponatremic. So the third cause of water gain is hypotonic IV fluids or excessive intake of low solute beverages. Hypotonic fluids include things like D5W, and low solute beverages include things like water. And then on this point, there's also a condition called psychogenic polydyspnea, and this is actually a mental health condition where people drink excessive fluid without the physiologic need, and it can occur in schizophrenic patients. The fourth cause of water excess is heart failure. So in decompensated heart failure, the heart is not pumping effectively. So the baroreceptors that are in the aorta will sense a low blood pressure. 
They will stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone and antidiuretic hormone will cause us to retain water, which will ultimately dilute our sodium and cause hyponatremia. Now let's move on to increased salt loss. The first salt loss we wanna talk about are gastrointestinal losses. So things like vomiting, diarrhea, or excessive nasogastric tube suctioning can cause increased sodium loss. The gastrointestinal tract has a lot of sodium in it, and any fluid loss in this area causes sodium loss and therefore hyponatremia. The second cause would be diuretics. Thiazide diuretics in particular increase sodium excretion. Loop diuretics can also cause hyponatremia, but this is less common. Salt loss can also occur through the skin, and this can occur in things like burns or excessive sweating. We'll do a lecture on burns later, but burns can actually change capillary permeability, and once capillaries become leaky, sodium can flow out of them pretty easily. And I think we can all relate to the sweating thing, unless you live in the north. But on a hot summer day, if you're outside, maybe you're exercising, working, or just existing and you're sweating a lot, and have you ever licked your lips and you taste salt? That's because your sweat is salty. When you sweat, you don't just lose water, you also lose salt. And an example of both water excess and sodium loss would be any kind of GI or skin loss by which we lose sodium, and then by which we replace that sodium loss with free water. So the most serious signs and symptoms of hyponatremia revolve around the fact that hyponatremia affects the central nervous system. Remember that if we have a low amount of sodium in our extracellular space, then water will flow freely into cells by way of osmosis, and this will cause cells to swell. Well, brain cells are very, very sensitive to cellular swelling. I like to think about the neurologic signs and symptoms of hyponatremia on a scale. Initially, when we have low sodium, we might have things like irritability or headache. As sodium continues to drop, we will get confusion. As sodium drops to severely low levels, you can get things like seizures, coma, and eventually death. So as far as the musculoskeletal symptoms, we will see things like diminished deep tendon reflexes, muscle cramps, and muscle weakness. Remember that the flow of sodium across a cell membrane is responsible for depolarization and the firing of an action potential. When we have low sodium, sodium cannot flow as quickly or as easily into a cell to cause depolarization and thus contraction of muscle cells. So hyponatremia will manifest as muscle weakness. In the gastrointestinal tract, musculoskeletal abnormalities of hyponatremia will result in abdominal cramping. And then in the integumentary system, depending on the cause of hyponatremia, people can have swelling of the extremities. And this is due to the shifting of fluid into cells and the interstitial spaces. For the diagnosis of hyponatremia, we would just draw a metabolic panel and see that the serum sodium level is less than 135. So as far as treatment goes, always treat the underlying cause. If the cause is water excess, restrict fluid intake. Additionally, for fluid volume excess, you may also be able to give osmotic diuretics, which will excrete water rather than sodium. If the cause is sodium loss, give oral or IV saline solutions. If the patient is in renal failure, then they will need dialysis. And if the cause is excess antidiuretic hormone, there are medications that can be given to block this hormone. Additionally, you can also give hypertonic saline, which is 3% sodium chloride, in small amounts if there are severe central nervous system symptoms. But you want to be careful about how you do this because if hyponatremia has been around for a few days, then the central nervous system has adjusted. 
and the brain cells have adjusted their internal osmolarity. If the brain cells become hyponatremic to compensate, and then you flood the blood with a hypertonic solution, what happens? The cells will shrink, right? And in this case, the myelin sheath can actually get destroyed and cause serious neurologic injury and death. So you want to be careful with that. And typically, because this solution is so hypertonic, it can be harsh on the veins. So they usually like to give it through a central line. As far as nursing interventions go, make sure you check intake and output to assess volume status and check a daily weight on the patient. Seizure precautions are another huge nursing intervention, and this is a huge NCLEX topic. So start this and sing it from the rooftops. And seizure precautions include things like padded side rails and low stimulation. Also, as a nurse, you need to be monitoring lithium levels if your patient is taking that medication. Hyponatremia inhibits the excretion of lithium from the body, and lithium can therefore build up to toxic levels. Lastly, you will need to administer medications. Hey guys, welcome back. Next week, we start talking about hypernatremia, so don't forget to subscribe. Hit the like button if you got value out of this video, and don't forget to share it with a friend if you think it could help them. Otherwise, stay safe, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you.